Today, let's answer this question. Is this the ultimate retro tape loading device? Hello, and welcome back to Noel's Retro Lab. Today, we're going to have a look at this. It's a cassette image playback device that works for almost every retro computer platform out there. It's called the SVI CAS, but that's a misnomer. Maybe it made sense when it was only supporting Spectra video models, but really today it should almost be called a universal CAS. The idea of a device to play back cassette image files isn't new. I've covered the TZX Duino at length, and I've also talked about the disadvantages of using a smartphone or a computer to play back those files. So just to set expectations right, if the cheap functional TCX Duino is a Toyota Corolla, the SVI CAS is the Tesla Model X. But let's not jump ahead of ourselves, and let's start from the beginning. This is a compact little device with truly minimal design on the outside. Just a smooth white case, a large screen in front, and some connectors in the back, and it definitely has some heft to it. It also has a slot for an SD card at the bottom, and do you notice anything missing? buttons. The screen is fully touch sensitive. Now, I'll be the first one to admit that I'm not a fan of touch screens, so that is one fear that I had going into it. In order to use it, you'll need cables to connect to the different computers. Normally, each computer has a cassette input and a cable that goes with it, except the Spectra Video and Commodore computers and maybe a few other ones. Those computers were intended to be used with custom taped decks only. Fortunately, you can order those cables for those platforms along with SVI CAS. And wow, they're kind of hard to tell apart. You need to count how many connectors each of them has to figure out which platform it is. I may have to do something about this later. I know you're eager to see it working, and so am I. But I just wanted to mention that it comes with a fantastic manual. A full 90 pages of really good information. Not because the device itself is complex, but because it will answer any questions you may have about some detail while you're using it. It also shows a table with every computer supported, and oh, that's a big table. It describes how to hook up the device correctly to each machine, and even what commands you need to type in each computer to load the programs from tape. That little touch is just genius. But really, you can take it without looking at the manual and start using it right away. Just throw some tape image files on the SD card, connect it to a 9 volt power supply, and you're ready to start. And here's where the big screen really shines. Everything is clearly labeled and is pretty intuitive, or at least intuitive enough to start using it. The most important bit is that by tapping on the top button, you cycle through the different computers to select the platform that you want. And yeah, again, that's a lot of them. We'll come back later for the rest of the options. For now, let's just go ahead and start loading the game. One fun thing about this device is that it's going to force me to go through a lot of computers in my collection. Because I have to admit, not all of them come out as much to play as they should. But this will be a nice excuse to take a lot of them out, test them, and also learn how to load stuff from tape, because I've actually never done that for some of them. So let's start with the SVI-328, since that's what the SVI CAS was initially designed for. This is one of those computers that will need a special cable. This cable can be purchased along with the SVI CAS, and it's definitely worth it. In the past, I've made my own, and it was wobbly and not very sturdy. This one is great. On the SVI CAS, you need to connect the ear cable to the output sound and the mic if you're going to record, and then the remote cable. I wish those ports were labeled on the device because otherwise it's not obvious at all which ones goes where. Yes, the excellent manual explains that, but it would be nice not to have to check there. Okay, now that I know, I'll try to remember for all the others. And we also need to power the SVI CAS with a DC barrel jack connector with 9 volts. It's too bad it can't draw power from the connector, because this particular connector has, uh, I think, 5 volts, but I suspect there just isn't enough current available to make it work. And here we run into the first snag. With this VI CAS connected, I get some pretty bad interference on the screen because of the power supply I'm using with it. Okay, I'll grab a different power supply and... Oh wow, this one is even worse. Okay, I think I'm going to have to take out the bench power supply, and that should be a lot less noisy. And yeah, that looks a lot better. So I suspect it will take some looking around to find the perfect power supply that minimizes noise into the computer for your particular setup. Now let's try loading a game. On the SVI CAS, it's just a matter of going into the files. There I see all the different directories I created. I actually did one for each platform. I go into SVI, and I'll pick Frantic Freddy, sure. One really cool part about the SVI CAS is that at this point, it shows you the files that are part of this game, and most importantly, their type. 
And that's because on some computers, like the Spectra video here, you need to type different loading commands depending on the file type. And since we see it's a binary file, we need to type this rather convoluted command, and if you forget it, it actually tells you in the manual exactly. I love how the loading screen shows the platform logo and then some very clear feedback about what is being played back and how much time there is left. You can also hear the data as it's being loaded because I turned on the option in the main menu to monitor the sound. I knew that on the SVI you don't hear it by default, and I'm used to the Amstrad in which you can hear that, and I like to have some audio feedback to make sure that something is actually happening. I would actually love to turn the monitor sound on and off in the loading screen itself instead of in the main menu, but that's a minor quibble. And after fast forwarding for a couple of minutes, the SVI cast shows that the loading is completed and here we have Frantic Freddy. It worked like a charm. Next, let's try an MSX, just because it's so closely related to the SVI. I imagine it's going to be very similar. We need to connect the MSX cassette cable. This particular cable is very common because most MSX computers used external tape players, so you'll be able to find this cable anywhere. Interestingly, as we cycle through the platforms, we have multiple speeds for MSX. I'm not sure why we have those options, but let's try the fastest one at 3600, just in case. And yeah, that one doesn't seem to be loading. It's, I see the computer is not picking it up at all. So let's try it with 2400. Okay, there it detects it, and this one seems to be fine. Ah, and this one is a perfect example of why having the remote cable is so important. This loading routine is constantly stopping the cassette to do some processing and display some stuff on the screen, so without it, the audio data would get out of sync and it wouldn't load correctly. And there we go. And there we have Fruit Panic for the MSX. You probably know by now that I can't resist peeking under the hood of any kind of electronics. So let's have a look and see what's inside the SVI CAS. We can carefully pop off the lid on the back and there comes the SD card connector. And it looks like the brains of the SVI CAS is an Atmega 2560 running at 16 megahertz. Specifically, this is a pre-built board, the Mega 2560 Pro Mini. There isn't much more to it, but I'll open it all the way. Okay, I don't want to open any more because I see some stuff there glued with hot glue. I can see there's some kind of adapter board, and if I peek inside the case, there's also the speaker, and really that's about it. So it's very simple and quite powerful, way more powerful than the Arduino for sure. So next, let's try my favorite computer, the Amstrad CPC. For whatever reason, the cassette cable I have for the Amstrad does not have a remote cable, but that's fine. In the main menu, I can toggle the remote signal off and the cassette will play all the time. That won't work for some of the games that require some pausing, but it will be fine for this test. I'll select the game Profanation, which uses a faster loading scheme than the default one. And yeah, that worked perfectly. And for those of you who played that game, that drop in the first screen is the stuff of nightmares. So far, we've just been loading games, which is something you could do with a TZX Duino and the right cables. But one of the features that really sets the SVI CAS apart is the ability to also record data from those computers into the SD card. Since I'm most familiar with Amstrad, let's use that as a guinea pig. What I'm going to do for this test is to load a program from disk. It's a basic game that my daughter wrote a couple of years ago. This is something we did together during the pandemic as a home programming course. Now I'll switch to tape mode and save it. And then on the SVI CAS, I need to tap on the record button, select where I want it to go, and enter a file name. Hitting all those letters there is probably the hardest thing you're going to do with this device. But even so, with a bit of care, you can do that with your fingers just fine. And now it's ready. So I press the key on the Amstrad, and yeah, it looks like it's working. Great. Now let's load it back and make sure it worked. It created a tap file on the SD card, so now we load it just like we did before. And yeah, that seemed to load just fine, so let's see. 
Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's the game she was working on. Great. Next up is the ZX Spectrum. This one should be no problem because it uses the TCX files, which are the exact same format as the Amstrad. However, I'm definitely curious to try it because the ZX Spectrum is notorious for being a bit deaf when it comes from loading from tape. In this case, it only has two ports, ear and mic, and no remote control at all. One cool thing is that this VI cast knows about that, so the default on the ZX Spectrum mode is that it will not wait for the remote control signal, so you don't really have to adjust anything. You just select the file you want, and here I'm going to load Manic Miner. And then you type load in the computer, and off it goes. And a few minutes later, we have that horrible, awesome Manic Miner music. Yeah, that worked. I'm really impressed so far with the SVI CAS. It has done everything we hoped for with minimal adjustments on our part. And for the most part, it's been a matter of just connecting the right cable, and it just worked. So initially, I wasn't planning on testing every platform it supported, but you know, at this point, it's going so smoothly that I think I might as well try to do that. That way, we'll find out if it's truly the ultimate tape device for retro computers. So here comes the ZX80, the ZX Spectrum oldest brother. This one is not actually a real one, those are pretty rare and expensive, but it's a modern replica including a nice 3D printed case and some custom stickers. It's definitely pretty awesome for someone without easy access to a real ZX80. I may have to cover this one in a future video. The ZX80 is a really, really primitive machine because it uses the CPU to generate the image. Whenever the CPU is doing anything, it pretty much stops generating the image itself. So when you press a key to type the load command, the whole screen goes blank for a split second. And obviously, whenever it starts the loading process, same thing, the screen just goes blank completely. The good thing about using cassettes for this platform is that it has so little memory that loading a full game is really quick. And yeah, in less than a minute, the game loaded just fine. And this is as close to a breakout clone as the ZX80 can do. It's actually pretty impressive for such a limited machine. Okay, perfect. One more that worked without any problems. Next, I wanted to do the ZX81, might as well. And in this case, it's a real one, not a replica one. Unfortunately, my ZX81 has a faulty ear port that I need to fix sometime, so I'm gonna have to skip it for now, so it sounds like it may be a topic for a future video. Okay, all done with Z80-based computers. Now, let's move over to the 65XX family. Let's start with a Dragon, but as you know by now, that should be pretty much the same thing as a Coco or a Coco 2. This particular one that I have in my collection is a Dragon 64, but the same thing applies to the Dragon 32. One funny thing I learned doing this is that the cassette connector for the Dragon computers has the exact same pinout as the Amstrad one. So I guess I could have used this cable with a remote connector when I tried that on the CPC. Whoops. Let's try loading Chucky Egg on this one. On the Dragon, you just need to type C load, which is similar to many other systems, probably because it's Microsoft basic. And yeah, it loaded and it works perfectly. Fantastic. Next, let's try an Acorn computer. We could do the BBC Micro, but that is pretty big. So I'm just going to go with a smaller Acorn Electron, much more convenient. But really, things should be about the same. I also need to use a custom cable with a DIN connector and the usual three cables. This one is almost like the Amstrad Dragon 1, but it's a DIN 7 instead of a DIN 5. I wonder what reasons they had to choose one DIN size over another. With Acorn computers, we need to make sure that the menu for the signal is set to inverted. And again, the SVI CAS knows about the platform and inverts it by default. So that's great. We're going to load Chucky Egg as well, and now that I think about it, really, I should have loaded Chucky Egg in every single platform for this video, and it would have been a fun comparison. Oh well, it's a bit of a missed opportunity. On the Electron, we need to switch to tape mode, and then use the chain command to load from tape. And yeah, that also loaded correctly without a problem. But wow, this version of Chucky Egg feels horrible. I don't know if this was intended for the BBC and here is different, but it's just slow and choppy and you can see the movement accelerate and slow down. Ugh, not impressive. Next is the turn of the Auric Atmos, another 6502 computer. And guess what? This one uses the exact same cassette cable as the Acorn computers. Okay, that certainly makes things easier. On the SVI CAS, we select the Auric entry. 
It has both the Auric One and the Atmos listed, but they're really the same computer. The only difference is that the Atmos has a fixed ROM and a much, much prettier case and keyboard. I'm going to choose a simple, small game, Insect Insanity. I don't know this game, but it sounds sufficiently cheesy. On the Auric, I need to type C load. And perfect, you see it detected it and it's loading. But, uh oh, it finished loading, but the Auric locked up and I see a random character on the screen. Was that a glitch? That was no glitch, unfortunately. I tried loading other games and nothing would load. Now, I read that some tape images work fine on the Auric One and not in the Atmos due to slightly different loading routines, but it would surprise me if all of them were that way. But just in case, I pulled out the TCX Duino and attempted to load the same game. And yeah, that loaded just fine. So has the SVI cast let me down? At this point, I was loving the idea of such a universal player and I didn't want it just not to work randomly on one platform like this. So I contacted Duncan, the creator of the SVI cast, and I started debugging the problem with him. Curiously, all those games were loading fine on his Auric One, but were failing on this Auric Atmos. And we knew it wasn't the computer, it wasn't the cables or the tape images, so it had to be the SVI cast. We investigated this for a while and even went as far as recording the output sound signal and examining in the Audacity to make sure that everything looked okay until we found the problem. The Auric Atmos, not the Auric One, expects a longer pause between the header data and the payload data itself. And once Duncan added that to the firmware, bingo, it worked perfectly on my Auric again. So that's great, and one more added to the list. Finally, we have left a very popular family of computers, the Commodore 8 bits. These are pretty special for a couple of reasons. First, they need a very special cable, just like the SVI 328, but you can also order it with the SVI CAS. Unfortunately, I got confused again which of the two cables it was for the Commodore. It would have been great if they had come already labeled, but since they didn't, I decided to take matters into my own hands and label them once and for all. There you go. Much better. I will not get confused anymore. The other reason the Commodore tape playback is special is because it's one of the more unique formats. It's based on edge transitions rather than on high or low values, so the playback has to be customized to deal with that. So let's try loading Commando, one of my favorite C64 games. Trying to load games from disk on a Commodore 64 involves some pretty hairy commands, but to load them from tape though, you just press shift and run and off it goes. <laughs> That's pretty neat. But that's pretty surprising because I don't think tapes were that big of a deal in the Commodore 64 lineup. Clearly, they were intended initially to use cartridges, but those were expensive and it had a lot of limitations. So I get the impression that most Commodore users used some kind of disk drive, which was notoriously slow, but that's another story for another day. One neat thing about this loader, which I suspect is a loader added by the group that cracked the game, is that it displays graphics and plays music while you load the game. Now, I don't know why the graphics look kind of corrupted though. Maybe it's an NTSC versus PAL issue with different timings. I'm not sure, but the music plays fine and we get a nice timer there with the counter. And yet, it's downloading and the game looks perfect. So I have no idea what the problem was with that loader. Ah, this command of music. I think people either love it or hate it. I grew up on the AY version of this tune, which is also great. So this one sometimes is a bit jarring with the way it bends the notes, but it's really a work of art. One thing to watch out with those cables is that the plastic guide in the middle doesn't pop out when you remove it from the connector, like mine almost did now. So keep an eye out for that every time you take it out, or even better, put a drop of super glue in there so it doesn't come out anymore. And while we're here, we might as well do the VIG-20. Again, there isn't a big catalog of tape games. On the VIG-20, it was mostly about cartridges, and I think that's because they could also come up with extra RAM to extend the very limited VIG-20. So I'm gonna select Frogger. Press Shift Run again, and off we go. Okay, yeah, there, you found it. Oh, I guess it's Hopper, not Frogger. Sounds like a clone to me. Yep, it loaded correctly, and oh wow, it doesn't even have a main menu. But yeah, the game looks fine. So what about other computers? The ones we've tried is the full list that the SVI CAS supports, but there are other computers out there that have a cassette input that we didn't cover. For example, the Apple II line of computers, the Atari 8-bit, or the Enterprise. 
I should mention that Duncan just added support for the Atari 8-bit line of computers in the next version of the firmware, so that will be taken care of. But for the rest, fortunately, you can still use the SVI CAS with those computers by selecting Generic Playback Mode. That way you can play any kind of audio tape file, and you can even play back a WAV file recorded as audio directly. As a final test, let's have a look at the kind of signal that the SVI CAS generates. Since I have some experience with the TZX Duino, this should make for an interesting comparison. To make it easy to measure the signal, I'm going to connect an audio jack connector to the ear cable coming out of the SVI CAS, and there I'll attach the probe of my oscilloscope. I'll start by playing some normal Amstrad CPC file, and that looks very good. Waves are very nice and square, even when they speed up. And now you can see very clearly the different lengths between zeros and one, so this is perfect. When I experimented with this in the past, I tried to create a really fast audio file that could be loaded on the Amstrad really quickly. One of the problems I ran into is that the Arduino just couldn't keep up with the speed I was trying to output because it was trying to load data from the SD card in time to play back without stalling the current playback. The Mega 2560 here is a much more powerful device, but it's not without its limits. It has just 8 kilobytes of SRAM, so it's not going to be able to fit everything of the audio file in memory and play back, so it needs to use the same kind of paging as the TCX Duino to load things into memory before playing them back. I've prepared some test files with 16 kilobytes of data with a fixed pattern, but with higher speeds. I'll start playing the one with zero periods of 500 cycles, which should be just a little faster than normal loading speeds. And yeah, that looks totally fine. You can see the pattern I'm generating, that is two short pulses, two long pulses, and then short, long, short, long. I did that to be able to catch more easily if it skipped any data. Okay, let's try 300 cycles next, and that looks rock solid as well. One way to check that things are working correctly is to zoom way out in the oscilloscope and look for any gaps or clear breaks in the pattern of the oscilloscope, but this one is looking nice and solid, so that's good. Let's jump all the way to 100 cycles now. This is where the Arduino couldn't keep up anymore. And this is looking good. The pattern is still there and zooming way out. Yeah, I don't see any weird pauses. Okay, let's try 50 cycles. And this one still looks okay. Now there are a couple little black lines when I zoomed out, but it's hard to say if that was the device skipping a beat or just a sampling issue with how the oscilloscope rendered the signal. And now let's go totally crazy and try 20 cycles. And again, I don't see anything obviously wrong, so maybe it's outputting this crazy fast signal. To be fair, Duncan warned me that it would probably not go past 500 kilohertz, which we're exceeding already, so maybe it's skipping some parts of the data and we just can't tell. But this is really promising, and I'll definitely follow that up in a future episode as I continue exploring how fast we can load audio data onto a computer. One thing we haven't talked about so far is its price point. It's certainly more expensive than a TZX Duino, which makes sense. It uses more expensive components, a faster microcontroller, a large touchscreen, a case, and all of that. And also, this is not an open source project, so you can't just buy the parts and build it yourself. All the ordering information is towards the end of the manual, which I've linked in the description, so you can go find it there. But as of the time of I'm making this video, an SVI cast unit costs 85 Australian dollars, which is about 50 euros or 60 US dollars. To that, you need to add the cost of shipping from Australia and any of the special cables that you may want to order with it. Duncan also mentioned that he may move manufacturing of the SVI CAS to the UK sometime in the near future, so that might change the shipping situation a bit depending on where you're located. So yes, this is more expensive, but it's also one device that will work for almost every platform out there, so depending how you look at it, it's quite a deal compared to buying different loading devices for several computer systems. It actually reminds me quite a bit of the situation with the RetroChip Tester Pro. You can have an inexpensive Arduino-based tester that will work for a few chips, and that's perfect for some people. Or you can get the expensive tester that works with lots of different chips, and that's great for other people with different needs. So it's the same case with SVI CAS. So in case it's not abundantly clear already, I love this device. This is going to be my go-to tape loading device for any computer in my collection, no doubt about it. It's just that good. The worst thing about it, it's this name, like I mentioned earlier. How many people are going to see it and dismiss it because they think it's just for Spectra Video Computers? It really should be called something else, like the Universal CAS or hopefully something catchier. I was definitely scared of the touchscreen interface going into it, and even more so because it came with a stylus, which made me think that your fingers weren't good enough for it. 
but it really worked great just with my fingers. I never had to use this. My only complaint is that the screen sometimes won't register two really quick touches in a row, so it's not quite as responsive as a smartphone, but it's totally functional. So could the SVI cast be improved? Sure, there are a few UI tweaks I'd love to see. A better selection for the computer platform so you don't have to scroll through all of them, the ability to turn on and off the monitor sound during the load would be great, and maybe even a little volume wheel would be totally cool. I think the firmware is pretty much using all the available space, so I don't think there's room for many more features, but really, it's great the way it is already. Anyway, that's all for today. I hope this video gave you a good idea of whether this device is a good fit for you and you enjoyed the video along the way. Let me know what you think of this device, especially if you had a chance to try it, and I will see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.